It was early in our visit to Palestine that we went over to the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Solon and stood literally on the rubble of a lovely home which had been destroyed two weeks prior. The home of the gentleman who met with us, the owner, was destroyed on Ash Wednesday. And as usual, that means the huge tractors come in and start eating the home alive. His best guess about why his home for which for generations his family has held legal ownership, why he was chosen is because of his activism. He's a community leader. He's active in nonviolent resistance. He's he sticks his head up and helps his neighbors be strong. And so we stood with him and felt the weight of what it means when someone says, I'm coming after your house. And then the thing is done. And then you stand there amid broken concrete. And Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, co-chair of ICAD USA, and, the and a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. At the beginning of February, Doug Tharp, Mark Braverman, Don Wegger, and I put out a nationwide call for the Stones Cry Out delegation to Palestine and Washington, D.C., February 26th to March the 6th. Here's a slide with uh, the sponsoring organizations. Eight different national organizations or local organizations sponsored our delegation. 23 church leaders and activists from 12 denominations around the country dropped everything they were doing and within three weeks our delegation met in bethlehem six days in palestine 17 meetings in four and a half days in bethlehem jerusalem ramallah and hebron then back to dc for two days of congressional meetings and actions the united church of christ was well represented four of the delegation members are with us today and i know stephanie's uh had a little computer problems and she'll come on in whenever she is available. We have uh, Diane Doolin. She's with the uh, UCC PIN and the Friends of Seville North America. Sarah Klokowski from Boston. She's a ministry associate. Stephanie Gilstrom. She's waiting to get in. She's uh, from the Rachel Corey Foundation. And Sarah Offner Seals. She's United Church of Christ, uh, Palestine Israel Network. And uh, she joined us in Washington, D.C. Diane, Sarah, Sarah, and hopefully Stephanie soon, welcome. So Diane uh, and Sarah Kay and Stephanie, as I said, we had 17 meetings in four and a half days. We'll get a chance to share uh, much more, but I, I'd like the three of you to maybe share that one experience uh, or visit that stands out in your mind as that as the one that was most impactful, the one that you really had to tell when you returned home. Diane, let's let's start with you. Of course, thank you, Michael. And thank you for leading us on this amazing delegation. It was early in our visit to Palestine that we went over to the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Solon and stood literally on the rubble of a lovely home which had been destroyed two weeks prior the home of the gentleman who met with us the owner was destroyed on ash wednesday and as usual that means the huge tractors come in and start eating the home alive his best guess about why his home for which for generations his family has held legal ownership why he was chosen is because of his activism. He's a community leader. He's active in nonviolent resistance. He's, he sticks his head up and helps his neighbors be strong. 
And so we stood with him and felt the weight of what it means when someone says, I'm coming after your house. And then the thing is done. And then you stand there amid broken concrete. And we simply hoped that by being there, he would know he has been seen and heard and that we would return and tell his story, which I am confident all of us have done. Thank you, Diane. Um, Stephanie, we're sharing that one visit or experience. I mean, we have lots of them, but we're sharing that one visitor experience that we just had to tell when we returned back home that impacted us the most. And you're muted right now, Stephanie. So if you could unmute to speak. There we are. Shall I relate, relate an experience? Please. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, hello to all of you. Um, I was able to take a tour of the South Hebron Hills, um, which is one hour south of Bethlehem. And uh, it is an area in the firing range of Son Z, which is under military control. And the Palestinians have absolutely no civil rights. And Mr. Harani, Hafiz Harani, and his two kids, uh, Sammy, age 20, and Samiha, age 23, they picked us up and took us to their house in Al Tawani and served us breakfast and hot tea. Anyway, he said that on October 8th, he witnessed uh, his 19 year old nephew being shot in the stomach when he was bringing his sheep back home from pasture and he is now permanently disabled. And then he took us for a walk about a half block from his house. He said that a villager was shot dead and his body was never returned. And uh, he said also that, well, he took us to, um, a lot of people have been displaced, their homes demolished. So they've moved to nearby caves. And we visited a family in one of these caves and uh, they had whitewashed the walls and tiled the floors so it's habitable. But they said that sometimes the settlers come and they steal the generators or break the water cisterns and it's still not safe. And then he took us to a Bedouin camp where there were a lot of displaced people living in impoverished shanties. And um, we saw hungry children running around barefoot. And he, he also, we met with the village elder who told us that uh, in December of this year, in a night raid, Israeli settlers, they rounded up 10 men and they forced them to sit on the floor facing the wall while they held loaded guns at their head and forced them to say demeaning things about themselves. And uh, interestingly enough, just 50 yards from this Bedouin camp is a ultra modern is illegal Israeli settlement with tile roofs and air conditioning and grass lawns. And we saw a settler dressed in military garb with an armed rifle watching us. And uh, that was unnerving. I and, know that first day, go ahead, Stephanie, please, yeah. And the last thing is that uh, Mr. Harani, he's in his mid sixties. And he said throughout his life, he's been arrested and tortured and imprisoned. But um, the first time it happened when he was he was 17 years old and he was being beaten and kicked to the ground by Israeli soldiers and his mother jumped on his body to protect him and she was kicked in the head and blinded in one eye. And so these are the kinds of things that are happening to people for years and years and there is never anyone held accountable. And that's Thank you, Stephanie. I, I know that that first day, uh, part of the pre-tour was very, very impactful for you. Sarah Kay, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me and for all of you for, for joining us today. I Picking up on what Stephanie just shared, I was able to be on that uh, uh, tour in the South Hebron Hills as well. And that, that day will absolutely be one of the days that stays with me. Um, that uh, 
night raid by a group of four settlers that Stephanie just referenced in that small Bedouin community in Umilher is the name of the town. One of those settlers is of the four or five settlers that has received um, sanctions by the U.S. Biden administration. That move to sanction just a handful of settlers by the Biden administration was commented on by a number of folks. And I remember particularly Isa Amro, which is the day that I'm really holding with me um, as we were touring uh, the old city in Hebron um, with Isa Amro, a, a human rights defender and nonviolent activist. Um, he referenced the fact that the Biden administration had called him in the months after uh, October 7th to try and ask who for some names of some settlers that can receive sanctions. And his response is, it's not about, I can't give you names. It's not about individual settlers. It's the settlements themselves that are the illegality. It's the settlements themselves that are the problem. Um, and, and we saw that, we experienced that uh, as we were walking around Hebron. We saw the, um, the fact that we have these two areas of the city, one H1 and H2, and there's this one area where um, the Palestinians that live there are basically cordoned off into these this very small area. No one else of their family and friends that live outside of that area is allowed in. There's 30 or so, 20 or 30 checkpoints, even just within that small region within Hebron itself. We weren't able to get in, but we were able to go around in that uh, in the vicinity and uh, see the impact of the settlement that has the Israeli settlement that has um, uh, been built within the city itself. And the fact that um, entire uh, Areas of the city that were once thriving uh, commercial centers, thriving businesses have been shut down for decades and even more so since October 7th, entire streets completely closed for business. Um, we were able to see the uh, netting that has been placed up uh, above the street uh, in order to protect the Palestinians below from the uh, settlers that throw trash and refuse and um, uh, acid water out their windows in order to make life as difficult as possible for the Palestinians below um, and, and to disrupt their lives as much as possible. But part of that experience was also seeing, bearing witness to some of those settlers, a group of them uh, coming out of their settlement in order to take a tour of the city and surrounded, uh, they were surrounded by 20 or 30 um, Israeli uh, uh military officials with their weapons. We called that day the day with all the guns because everywhere we went, there were um, either uh, military officers or or um, settlers themselves holding guns and, and brandishing them. And some of them were pointed directly at us. Basically, these settlers were walking around in this area in Hebron in order to make their presence felt and they were being protected from us and from the, the Palestinians in that, that area by the Israeli military uh, with their weapons. And so it was just something to, an image that will forever be in my mind of a little boy, a little Palestinian boy standing in front of this wall of soldiers with guns all uh, just lined up in a row in front of him um, in his home. Thank you, Sarah. I, uh, you can tell folks that uh, <clears throat> we had some very impactful experiences in Palestine. I'm going to just uh, ask uh, Diane and Sarah and Sarah and Stephanie. I have a whole list of questions here, and uh, we have we have a limited amount of time, so um, we want to keep our our answers as brief, but also as as direct. I mean, we really appreciate how these have moved you. These experiences have moved you. Uh, we want to get into as many of these experiences and the people we met with as possible. Uh, Sarah Offner Seals, um, you traveled with me last June, uh, and in addition to what, uh, in addition to just what you experienced during that trip, um, you are now joining a nationwide hunger strike. Day four of five days. Tell us what inspired you, motivated such a step for you, and what you're learning. Well, um, I was inspired and motivated. Uh, I'll say I was motivated by just the immense amount of suffering that we've seen in Gaza 
since October 7th. And uh, I traveled with, like Michael said, I traveled with him uh, back in June of 2023 to the West Bank. And uh, <clears throat> it just really broke my heart into a million pieces. A lot of the same things that um, that you've just heard, we had similar experiences. We went to a lot of the same places. And I tell people that I left parts of my heart there in Palestine. And that's, I think, when October 7th happened and we started to see such massive amounts of human suffering, especially suffering of children, that's really what moved me. Um, and in particular, what we see now, which is a mass starvation event, uh, what I've heard people talk about as a massacre in slow motion. Um, we, and UN experts have called it uh, an intentional starvation. And so uh, that's really what inspired me to join this hunger strike. I received a phone call at my office at the church. I don't know how that was, I don't know how that got to anyone, but, and they invited me to join and I said, yes. So I am on day four of the, uh, I have not eaten anything since Sunday evening and I will, uh, I will continue to hunger strike until um, the end of the day on Friday tomorrow. And uh, throughout this strike, uh, all of us who are participating have been taking political action every day as well. There are people, part of the strike who are in DC, who are demonstrating in front of the White House, demonstrating in front of uh, the National Cathedral today, going to visit with members of Congress. And from my office here in Fort Wayne, I've been uh, calling and emailing my members of Congress have been calling and emailing the White House and uh, the Vice President's office every day. Um, and so I just hope that all of our actions um, together um, can pressure our, our government to, to take more efficient and effective action as opposed to making statements. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> our uh, delegation report, like I say, the, the link for it is in the chat room. Uh, and it begins with a very clear uh, and direct statement from Palestinian American businessman Sam Bahor, who started off by saying, this is a U.S. war. This is a U.S. war. And uh, it, it, his statement is repeated throughout our report. U.S. money, U.S. weapons, U.S. vetoes of ceasefire uh, resolutions in the U.N. Uh, Stephanie and Sarah Offner Seals, talk to us about U.S. hypocrisy and U.S. double standard. Sarah and then Stephanie. Well, I think, um, you know, when it comes to the U.S. hypocrisy, we have our own laws here in the United States that should prohibit us from sending military aid and arms sales to Israel. We have something called the Foreign Assistance Act, which uh, should, which does not allow us to send aid, military aid, to uh, countries that are engaging in, um, that are not allowing sufficient humanitarian aid to enter into conflict zones. Um, and so by that law uh, that is in place uh, already, we should not be able to offer uh, weapons um, to Israel. There's also the Leahy, uh, the Leahy law, which, um, which says that uh, we should not be uh, giving military aid to countries that are violating human rights and international law. And so it is very hypocritical that we have these laws in place in our own country and we are breaking them every time we send weapons, every time Biden has gone around Congress to uh, to sell uh, weapons to Israel over the last few months, that has been a violation of U.S. law. Um, and there's probably many, many other ways I could name, but I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Sarah. Stephanie, please. And Stephanie, you're uh, muted. Um, <clears throat> U.S. policy has failed to bring about peace uh, in the area. And the United States has been complicit in supporting Israel in its violation of international human rights. 
And uh, the massacre in Gaza has sparked international outrage and the humanitarian agencies call for a ceasefire. But um, a majority of United States voters want an, a permanent ceasefire and they want conditions on military aid to Israel to be compliant with human rights laws. And the United States has um, actually been complicit in the conditions rising up to the October 7th attack by supporting um, Israel's violation of human rights and uh, what the suffocating blockade against Gaza and the belligerent actions of the Israelis in the occupied West, West Bank. So we say that we're trying to help and make peace, but all the while we're supporting Israel in these uh, terrible acts. Thanks, Stephanie. In fact, uh, if you remember uh, <clears throat> in uh, Ramallah, when we mis visited with uh, military court watch, Gerard Horton said, uh, said uh, the Palestinians are saying, don't preach to us anymore about human rights and democracy. Uh, not only are you undermining U.S. credibility, but more importantly, you're undermining the very norms, the very rule of law by which nations live together. Uh, Diane and Sarah, uh, Sarah Kay, <clears throat> we heard from a number of our speakers that they feel isolated and uh, alone. Uh, but by the way, Sarah Offner Seals, would you put into the chat uh, the the uh, link to UCC PIN while we're talking? And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So uh, Diane and Sarah Kay, we heard uh, from Rifat Kassis, Ka Kairos Palestine, and from Pastor Munther Isaac, a real frustration and even anger. They kept asking, where's the Western church? Not only those on the religious right are captive to an absolutist support for Israel because of a, a heretical interpretation of the Bible, but, and this was the real cause for anger, right? Uh, progressive churches cowed into silence, not wanting to offend. The church is complicit in Israel's genocide in Gaza as well. So uh, Diane and, and Sarah Kay, I want you to, I want you to talk to that. Uh, the Western church's complicity either by support of Israel or the progressive church's silence and its impact on our Palestinian friends. Uh, Sarah and then Diane. <clears throat> Thank you. I am um, reminded of something Rafat said. He talked about how if, if the church does not stand for its ethical beliefs, why do we need the church at all? Um, why is there a church, period? Um, and I, I that question resonates with me. It has resonated with me as I continue to wrestle with what is the church and my local church and the church at, at large doing um, in response to this. Another thing that was said uh, often was, um, you know, uh, it's as if in the the Jesus uh, narrative around uh, you gave, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. It's actually, I was thirsty and you gave me a statement. I was hungry and you gave me a statement. Um, and so often the statements and the responses, not just like you say on the right, which is deeply steeped in the Christian Zionism that I was raised within, but also churches and the mainline churches, uh, desire to kind of toe the line, to not take a side, to try and uh, seem as if we are appeasing both sides in some form or fashion, make a statement that is as uh, middle of the road as possible on this, has ended up uh, just um, making us complicit in this ongoing uh, uh, problem. And, and for me, um, my desire is to see the church take a side. My desire is to see as Jesus took sides, as God takes sides, takes the side of the oppressed, is to take the side of the oppressed um, and to take the side of those who have been military occupied for generations. And one thing that um, Luther Isaac said was that um, it's as if the church has uh, chosen to sacrifice Palestinians on the altar of our atonement for anti-Semitism. 
and recognizing the fact that for thousands of years, uh, the church was uh, the main producer of anti-Semitism in the West. And rather than atone for our own anti-Semitism and actually do that internal work, we have projected that out onto the Palestinian people and made them the sacrifice in order to uh, uh, atone for it. So I'd like to see us do the work of reckoning with our own Christian anti-Semitism and Christian uh, Zionism that produces this military industrial complex and 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 not just make statements but take action. Thank you, Sarah. Diane. Well, I want to say very personally that when I heard those statements, I felt convicted and ashamed. I I I am always so proud of the United Church of Christ and the ways in which we do offer leadership. And, I, and I'm and i sure that will always be true. So right now I'm speaking about myself and also the wider church, that my reflection upon hearing those statements more than once during that week have led me to really understand too often I am um, kind of automatically going into a diplomatic mode of wanting to be heard and therefore not to seem unhearable or not to seem um, condemning of the very people listening to me. And, and I think that is sometimes the, the challenge that we have in our activism, in our work, in our churches, in our denomination, in our preaching. And the shame that we as Americans deserve to feel. Watching an unfolding genocide being condoned by people for whom we have voted, by people who say, I will not listen to you, I will say nice words, and then I will continue to prove you the one who is trying to challenge me, I will prove you the fool because I know how to get around the yeah. laws. And our president knows how to send just enough military aid so that certain laws don't kick in to stop him or to require Congress to review what he's done. So I feel shamed. I feel uh, made a fool. And those are accurate feelings and accurate conclusions. And so my, my reflection continues after I'm home to somehow break out of my well-trained politeness and diplomacy to, to preach a bolder prophetic message, which is the message of the stones crying out. Because if they don't cry out, if the, the people do not cry out, the stones will. And if our message upon coming home does not truly cry out what the people are saying, then we are leaving it to the stones. Yeah. So that's a that's a struggle that I will probably take with me the rest of my life. But it was brought to such clear focus when listening to these Palestinian leaders who go out every day and open themselves to violence and trouble and do not spare these words even to those of their friends who come, the people they, they've told us in all sincerity, we're so glad you've come. Now go home and really challenge every circle where you operate, including the circle of the church. We, uh, thank you, Diane. We heard right that uh, we now know who our friends are and we now know who our friends are not, and that uh, that that can't can't help but strike at the heart, right, of each one of us. Sarah Offner Seals, uh, <clears throat> uh, along with a number of other folks uh, on the call today, um, who are either present, uh, presently, or formerly members of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network Steering Committee. You just began in uh, January, your term. Talk to us about some of the resources that UCC PIN has for pastors and churches as they as they try to engage their congregations with this issue, 
particularly about Christian Zionism? Well, I would say that the probably the best resource that is available right now and that is most relevant to what's going on in Gaza is the Crisis in Gaza resource. And that is, I believe, a, it's four or five parts. I think it's a five-part uh, presentation that, so you could split it up into five sessions of an adult Sunday school class or an after church, a second hour sort of uh, learning opportunity, or you could sort of pick and choose what seems most relevant um, for your congregation. But it's a PowerPoint presentation that has narration and videos within it, uh, embedded within it. So, um, and each, you know, each, uh, each part, I think, could take about 45 minutes to an hour to share with a small group or congregation, um, a Sunday school class, etc. And it has everything from, oh, and I see that it has been shared in the chat. That's great. Um, so it has everything from a very detailed history of the occupation and settler colonialism and uh, the conflict. It has, uh, I believe it has a section on Zionism, anti-Zionism, Christian Zionism. Um, and so, and it, it details all of the different terms that get thrown around a lot, apartheid. What does apartheid mean? Why is this, why is Israel an apartheid state? Um, settler colonialism, what does that mean? What does that look like? Why do we call it that? Um, so all of these, these terms that you might hear that are, uh, you know, um, have a lot of uh, controversy around them, you can really explore why these terms are appropriate, why they get applied in this situation and have some good discussion uh, with your congregation around them. I think it's a, I think it's, I was not part of the, the work putting that together. Uh, that happened before I came on, but I've looked at the resource and it's, I think a remarkable resource. It has a message from UCC PIN member, John Thomas, who's the former president of the, President and General Minister of the United Church of Christ. It has uh, videos from Jewish Voice for Peace, has many different voices. Uh, Peter McCary, who is also uh, a UCC leader, um, there's a video from him. So uh, lots of different voices and resources uh, are in that crisis in Gaza PowerPoint. And you can show it in a number of different ways. If you don't have access to PowerPoint, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, if you can also download the PowerPoint and present it that way. So we try to make it available for people in multiple ways for multiple uses. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> I would just I would just want to uh, encourage you all to, if you haven't before, check out the UCC PIN website. They have ver various resolutions from the past, other webinars, and just lots and lots of resources for the parish. It's a uh, it's a hands-on, practical, can-do sort of resource, and uh, please do that. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, most important and moving for me meetings we had was with uh, Adam Balukas, the head of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency uh, in East Jerusalem. Uh, your reactions, your brief reactions, uh, to that meeting, uh, Sarah Kay, Diane, and Stephanie. Well, um, it was uh, deeply powerful and, and uh, moving to meet with Adam. Um, to see, you know, to to put the context of what we were talking about this this ongoing genocide in Gaza um, that is all eyes are rightfully on Gaza right now as a result of what's happening, but to also put that in context with this slow moving genocide that many of the folks we met with uh, talked about and what's happening in the West Bank and what has been happening in the West Bank. So he described the um, impact of the last several months on uh, the on, on the West Bank, the fact that we've got you know 220,000 uh, Palestinians living in the West Bank that have work permits to work in Israel that have not been able to go into Israel since uh, October 7th, uh, talked about the impact on the economy, talked about the impact on many different business sectors, talked about the um, ongoing night raids and violence happening in all different sorts of Palestinian communities, the fact that many refugee camps have 
the streets that have been torn up by Israeli bulldozers, restricting movement. I mean, the day that we were there, one of the UNRWA workers uh, was attacked by settlers um, in the West Bank. So just all the different things that are happening that um, the, the tools of uh, apartheid to produce this ongoing, uh, slow moving genocide that has been ramped up in the last several months um, were things that we talked about. And it was uh, stark to, to hear about it from, from somebody who is working with an organization that is doing direct uh, aid, direct support, and such a support that um, is is irreplaceable from any other organization. He talked about the fact that they have the, he, they do this wide ranging uh, uh, services that they offer that cannot be replaced, and the fact that they've got weeks left without uh, the the budget that they need as a result of the U.S. and other countries cutting off aid, and so um, really emphasize the importance of their work. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, he said that our, there are 30,000 employees that serve Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, and Syria for refugees. 30,000 people in place to help with infrastructure, infrastructure, um, education, public health, uh, everything that you can think of. And uh, 30,000 employees. And it was alleged by Israel that 12 of them participated in the October 7th attack. But they never provide any evidence or substantiation or anything to uh, document that. And a recent report came out, I think, by an in, uh, independent investigative body that showed that some of those uh, UN employees were, you know, captured and tortured to give that type of information. So... All of this is happening, happening without uh, hard evidence. Thank and you, it, Stephanie. Thank yeah. you, Diane. Well, to return to my prior statement, the moral bankruptcy of our nation to immediately cut off this aid is devastating. We we drop the bombs, we cut off the aid, we provide the diplomatic cover. Um, the moral bankruptcy is just stunning. Other countries have now restarted their aid. I read yesterday, according to Reuters, that our aid has now been cut off for the next year. So there is no remorse on the part of our leaders. I also wanna mention that the, the, the land that we sat on when we visited with Adam Balukas, who had such incredible stature as a leader of UNRWA. We were all just speechless with admiration for him and what he told us. They live on a big piece of property in East Jerusalem. We know that Israel wants to get rid of UNRWA in general forever. Adam also told us they very much covet the land upon which we were sitting. Right. So that that it could continue the work it's doing of annexing all of East Jerusalem mm -hmm. and ridding it of any any influence that is not Jewish Israeli. So it, it, it is one of the things that I, I believe every one of us said when we met with legislators in Washington, D.C., we begged them. And I said to the staffer I talked to, this should be the easy thing, just restart UNRWA funding. I'm not talking about major peace process. I'm talking about restart the funding that is so necessary because of our complicity and our sponsorship of genocide. We were expecting diplomats speak, weren't we? And we walked in and it was like a bomb dropped. I mean, he he was just clear cut and direct. And he shared with us, right, that uh, because of the threats and attacks upon UNRWA workers and himself personally, that his family had been evacuated uh, back to the to the U.S. I think back to upstate New York from where he uh, comes. Let me ask you. Um, let me ask you this. Um, Sarah Kay talked about our time in Hebron. So, um, Diane, I want you to I, I want you to uh, uh, share with us a little bit about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Sarah Kay to talk about our time with the CPTers. 
but I want you to talk to us a little bit, Diane, about our time with Isa Amro and his impact upon upon us, and particularly about the presence of the the military presence that we encountered. Isa Amro is an amazing man. I believe he's been nominated for the Nobel Prize. He spoke to us with such um, passion, saying, I stand before you committed to nonviolent resistance, and that nonviolent resistance has been deemed illegal by Israel. He told us that he was arrested after October 7th, imprisoned, tortured, and continues to, to bear the scars of that. His hands are, his fingers are numb because of the nature of torture that he experienced. He said that he was warned, that this was just rich. He was warned by military to leave his home for his own safety. <laughs> From them. He wanted to scream and say, how many times do you think that's gonna work? That's how Palestinians were forced to leave their homes in 1947. And so he he talked about these experiences. He tries to have, he, he said, we need you to come. He wants people to come and spend the night at his house. He feels safer that way because he knows that any night the military can come and arrest him and claim his home. We, of course, were surrounded by military every step that we took. This, the, the young soldiers, the young settlers, oh my goodness, the smirks on their face to watch these well-meaning Americans trudging around old Hebron. Um, some of the experiences that I had shamed me. This one enraged me. Yeah, and yeah. I, wanted to wipe that smile off their face um <laughs> in a very non-violent way of course is a of good course. Way to <laughs> thank you diane uh yeah um sarah Kay, um your uh, uh ex our experience with the cpt years in hebron Thank you. Yeah. So we uh, in, in Hebron, as we were walking through the city, we were able to stop briefly and meet with a group of four young Palestinian activists local uh, uh, to the area. Um, CPT is a community peacemaker team and and are for a long time, uh, it was comprised of a lot of internationals or people coming from different areas to come and do, uh, to bear witness, to do accompaniment work, um, to document violence of settlers and Israeli soldiers against uh, Palestinians, especially against children. Um, and in recent years, that has shifted to where it's mostly local Palestinian activists, uh, peaceful activists that are uh, the ones that we met with accompanying children on their way to school. And so they meet them at the checkpoint as they are uh, exiting the small area in Hebron where nobody else can go. If you don't live there, you, they can't go directly to the door. They have to wait for them at the checkpoint and they walk with them to school. They stay at the school and they walk them back. The reason they stay at the school is a lot of times uh, Israeli military, when they do the raids and, and pick up children for arrest, they pick them up from school. And so the CPTers, they stay there to bear witness, to document when a child, where a child is, and um, to make sure that if some, if they get picked up, somebody knows where they are. So they will then journey with them back to the checkpoint. And um, if a child is being detained at the checkpoint, they will call different organizations, uh, uh, Red Crescent or, or, or whomever, to say a child is being detained. So somebody knows where they are. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. We, uh, um, the whole time we were talking with them on the street, right, The uh, we saw on the rooftops uh, Israeli soldiers with their guns pointed down at us and at Issa and at, at, at the CPTers. Um, yeah, that was a very, and we saw the Shabbat parade, of course, that you referred to earlier uh, of settlers surrounded by military. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you to say a word about Daoud uh, Nassar and the Tent of Nations, but be while you're thinking about what you want to say, I was on the phone with Daoud yesterday, 
he called me and he said that, uh, Michael, we're, there's been a new development. There's a road being planned by the Israelis coming from the east that uh, will go through, uh, go partially through our property. So he said that the uh, the efforts to isolate them have been escalated even further, and he's feeling more and more uh, uh, threatened uh, by uh, the presence of the Israelis on their land. Stephanie, what stood out for you from our time with Daoud and Amal and Daher Nassar? Well, I'd like to say one more thing about uh, <clears throat> the city, the Heb the. Hebron city. It's a city of 250,000 people. And within the past 20 or 30 years, 33,000 illegal Israeli settlers have taken over the city center, the old ancient center of Hebron. So if you can just appreciate that, how unfair that is to begin with. And anyway, I just wanted to add at that. Uh, yes, with um, in uh, the because what? there's a lot of misinformation out there related. Yeah. Go I, ahead. Uh, I, I I muted the blossoms there, or Tom and Blossom. Yeah, go ahead. Um. Well, Um. in the Tent of Nations, uh, uh, Daoud Nasser and his family, they've owned their land there since uh, 1916. And so they've been fighting over the courts for the last 40 years to try to keep their land. But... Um, Anyway, he lives in the same uh, area as Hafaz Hurani, who I told you about in the South Hebron Hills. And I believe it is like in the firing range, Son Z, uh, which is a place where their military have absolute control and they have absolutely no civil rights. And so um, it's just uh, interesting how we were just on his land eating lunch that they prepared for us and suddenly these two uh israeli settlers they walked right in front of his house carrying automatic weapons and just walking as if they owned it intimidating uh the people there and so anyway what i see is that they are in dire circumstances and danger of being killed or wounded or or worse you know and it's hard. I've read about police states in history, but I have never witnessed it in my with my own eyes. And that would tell me yesterday, sorry. Stephanie. He kind of uh, he reinforced, I think, what you just had to say that that uh, uh, had had it not been for us being on the property with him that day, had it not been for had it not been for international's presence. I mean, there was only one international there when we were there, and there's only one international there now, I believe. But had it, has it, had it not been for international presence, he and Amal, his sister, and Daher, his brother, they fear for their lives. They could be shot on their property and left for dead. And so he, the, the international presence is really critically important. Uh, Sarah Offner Seals, uh, you were part of the DC Planning Committee. We'll get to the, some of the rest of it, the visits or the, the the interface service later. But Sarah, talk to us about the action in front of the White House uh, when we were in DC. Sure. So that we had a number of things on the DC Planning Committee that we were responsible for, and one of them was a vigil and protest in front of the White House at Lafayette Park, Lafayette Square. And uh, we gathered with, uh, it's hard to say, I don't know, maybe one or 200 folks. Um, it was raining, <laughs> um, but we had, uh, we had, it was a interfaith, uh, vigil. There were Muslim leaders, there were Christian leaders, and there were Jewish leaders there. And we sang, um, we prayed, uh, and we spoke. Some members of the delegation uh, spoke about their experiences in the West Bank. We, um, after the, the vigil, uh, there was a group of people who were committed to a civil disobedience action and they went up to the gate in front of the White House to put up a ceasefire banner. They attached it to the gate, uh, which I believe is illegal, but they didn't get arrested um, for doing so. We, it was a peaceful protest. Um, 
And uh, I'm not sure what else you want me to say about it, Michael, but it was a very powerful experience um, to just be with uh, folks from all three faiths, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, all of us strongly committed, not only to a ceasefire, um, because that is something that is immediately needed, but all of us also committed to justice for the Palestinian people um, after the, what happens after the ceasefire is, is even more important than the ceasefire itself. We can't just go back to the status quo and things as they are or have been. We need, an, we need a, a commitment to justice. We need a commitment to a Palestinian state that is realistic and workable. And I was just very moved um, to be with so many interfaith colleagues, so many interfaith um, folks who are so committed to this cause. It really energized me um, and it gave me strength um, to, keep, to keep fighting. Thanks, Sarah. Stephanie, um, our delegation report ends with the recounting of the protest self-immolation of Aaron Bushnell, um, uh, whose name was brought up on a number of occasions by people with whom we met. Uh, he, he, as he was, uh, 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 as he was uh, going to uh, to uh, to do this uh, this act of self-immolation, he wrote, "I will no longer be complicit in genocide. I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest. But compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it's not extreme at all." His name was brought up. Rachel Corey's name was brought up. By the way, Rachel Corey just this past Saturday. 21 years uh, since her murder uh, on March the 16th. We should remember her today as well. But we but we heard Aaron's name and Rachel's name as heroes. Why was it important that we closed our report remembering Aaron and now as we remember Rachel? Okay, I, I just wanted to tell people that um, Craig and Cindy Corey, the parents of Rachel, were interviewed on Democracy Now! yesterday. So you can yeah. see Amy Goodman um, interview them. And so as far as uh, Aaron is concerned, uh, he was active military, and he did that in front of the uh, Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. And Diane and I went and saw the memorial that has been set up for Aaron. Right. And uh, the people have just kind of... Uh, confiscated the land, the public land in front of the Israeli embassy and set up, they have 24 hour vigils and tents and chairs and candles. And they've even, I, from what I've heard now is that they they um, play these loud sirens to bring attention all of the time. And so I think that's really the right thing to do. And uh, if not now, then when? That's what it is. And uh, we have to speak out can't stop, can't worry about who the audience might be. We just need to say it. And I appreciate what he did. And there was another woman who set herself afire as well, but she was severely injured, but we don't ever hear her name. And I wonder who that, that that's important as well. Yeah, Aaron, and like I said, and Rachel Corey, uh, of course, uh, um, mentioned often um, uh, wherever we went. Sarah Kay, um, we also heard about the International Court of Justice ruling on the, on the South African revolu resolution that called what uh, the Israeli regime uh, uh, and what they're doing plausible genocide. Talk about that, will you please? Yes, I mean, that was uh, brought up a, a number of times. It's just, uh, once again, uh, appreciation for the uh, solidarity of the South African people. I mean, one of the 
the things that will stay with me personally is going to Nelson Mandela Square and just um, sitting in this uh, public display, the symbol of pu a public display of solidarity, international solidarity, and remembering that all of our uh, oppressions are bound up together and that our liberation is bound up with one another and that um, I'm not free until Palestine is free. Um, and so there was a what I heard from a lot of folks, recognition and appreciation of that solidarity from South Africa, but also, uh, a, once again, more and more rage at the uh, failure of international law and the international community to actually act on this um, this small step that was taken by the International Court of Justice, just to acknowledge that it's a plausible genocide. Um, and so everywhere that we went, there was a feeling of what's the use of international law if, if even um, the smallest of steps that was taken of recognition of a plausible genocide, nothing comes of it. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it was a mixture of feelings, appreciation, and, and once again, despair and, and feeling of abandonment that I heard. Sarah, you know, what, one of the things that you reminded us throughout this interview is that, and I really appreciated it, is that while our eyes are rightly turned to Gaza, we heard again and again and again that this genocide is happening. They said slow motion, but it's happening in the West Bank. Yes. And I don't want to say it's the real story, but it certainly is a story that needs to be told, right? And so our eyes are turned to Gaza, but we can't we can't ignore what's happening in in the West Bank. And I really appreciated you emphasizing that for us, Sarah. You can't you can't, I think, understand what's happening in Gaza without putting it in the context of the last 75 years and without putting it into context with what's happening in the West Bank. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Diane. Uh, along with that, this this idea of genocide in the West Bank, one of the one of the more powerful times for us, right, was our visiting with military court watch Sawa and Gerard, uh, Sawa Duebus and Gerard Horton, uh, uh, Horton, and uh, then with uh, Sahar Francis at Adamir, and Sahar telling us, along with two or three others, that we were the first delegation to meet with them since. Uh, October the 7th, and they're used to two or three at a time. But um, you you have particular knowledge uh, about night raids and child prisoners, and I wanted you to say a word about that, Diane, uh, in the context of our meetings, but also in the context of the UCC PIN resource that we have on night raids and child prisoners that you know something about because of Tom Bileman and his work on that. Absolutely. Gerard Horton's experience and insights about the abuse of children and a whole generation, actually generation after generation of young people in Palestine will never do less than leave me devastated. And his description of the night raids, the destruction of childhoods, of families, of any sense of safety, of any hope for the future. These are all reflected in a resource which is available on our UCC PIN website called How Are the Children? And this is a two-part curriculum which was created by my husband, Tom, and by others from United Church of Christ, Palestine, Israel Network, following a resolution that we passed on the subject of arrest and detention of children. It's a very powerful two-session curriculum. It's been shown across the country and just very routinely gets the highest marks and um, ratings for the quality of the presentation and the material that it presents. It turns out to be very empowering to congregations and to activists. Many people don't know what goes on with children in Palestine. So they learn that and they learn how the context of international law can help us understand the egregious nature of this abuse that children experience. Just the one last thing is as we have here over and over again and lament in our American context, the way in which children were abused, indigenous Native American children were abused and taken away from their families. Yeah. 
one thinks over and over that very little of what Israel is doing couldn't be learned from looking at our own American history. I won't go off on my jag about that, but it just seems that the parallels are great and constant and numerous. And once again, it brings us into that circle of accountability. We hear um, the word. The word is uh, um, you talk about lost childhoods. You know the trauma, just the ongoing trauma. There's no. Who did we hear it from? There's no such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder because it's present traumatic stress. It's ongoing, continuing traumatic stress, right? Uh, and talk, so you talk about lost children and what kind of what are, what are we creating, right? What are we creating? Uh, in terms of the cycle of violence uh, on, and the cycle of resistance, uh, is Israel feeling less safe now because of its actions in Gaza and the West Bank, right? It's a self-perpetuating cycle of violence. So, Diane, thanks uh, thanks for really emphasizing the kind of traumatic experiences on children, particularly. Sarah Offner Seals, you and Paula Roderick planned the interfaith service that wrapped up our delegation in D.C. It, it featured Christian clergy, a rabbi, an imam, along with others. One of the featured speakers, our featured speaker, was Representative Rashida Tlaib, Michigan. And one of the move, most moving uh, parts of the service for me was, in addition to her talk, really, was the spontaneous blessing spoken upon her by the representatives of the three faiths, in which you took part, Sarah. Talk to us about the Interfaith Prayer Service and what, what was meaningful to you. Can you hear me? I think I'm having some, oh, some we internet. Can hear you. We can hear you, Sarah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that was probably the most moving part of the DC uh, trip for me. It was the culmination of our time together. And I think, uh, what you said about the interfaith involvement, Christian, Jews, and Muslims, powerful speakers from each of the three faiths, um, it really brought home to me that this is not about Christians versus Jews or Muslims versus Jews uh, or, or even Palestinians versus Israelis. This is about human rights and human dignity for all. And it's about standing up for those values. And it doesn't matter what faith you are, we're all human. And we can all see the human suffering that is uh, currently happening, that has been happening for so many years, but is so acute right now, especially in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. And, um, you know, that was that was meaningful to me. And I think when Rash when Representative Talib got up and spoke, what was so affecting to me in that moment and what I think prompted the spontaneous blessing by all three faith traditions was how vulnerable she was when she got up and spoke. Uh, you know, we think of her as part of the uh, part of the squad and uh, sort of a fiery uh, warrior for justice. And she was so vulnerable. She got up and she said, I don't feel seen by my colleagues in Congress. Um, and she she even got a little teary, got a little choked up. And one of my colleagues, the, the head organizer of the DC contingent, Doug Thorpe, leaned. I was sitting next to him. He leaned over to me and he said, "What if, what if we did a blessing?" And at first, I was like, oh, "I don't know," because you know, I didn't want to presume that that would be okay. But as she was coming down from the chancel, I just I sort of intercepted her and said, "Could we do a blessing?" And she's like, "Sure, of course." And we invited uh, Reverend Gradlin Hagler to come up and lead the blessing. We had the rabbi and the imam present with us as well. And uh, a few of us laid hands on the, the Congresswoman and just blessed her for her work, blessed her for being a voice for justice, for standing up for the truth, even dis despite uh, being attacked, even by members of her own party um, and the courage that she has um, to stand with her people and to stand for the truth uh, was inspiring to all of us. Um, and I think there was something serendipitous about the way that that service came together 
sort of everyone at the last minute, everything kind of uh, culminating uh, with Lucy Murphy, who is a, a singer and activist and community organizer, who we called the night before the service and said, hey, can you come and lead some singing uh, at the end of the service? And she was like, you know, this is last minute and I got a lot of requests, but this is really important. So yeah, I'll be there. And uh, she just led us in a couple of songs uh, uh, for, for Palestine. And that was very powerful. And the, the sense of, of solidarity uh, between all of the different faith communities, the sense of solidarity. We saw people come to that service who had been involved in the vigil earlier in the afternoon or the day before. We saw people come to the service whom we'd met the day before uh, from the, Palest the, the Museum of the Palestinian People and from the Middle East uh, Report. Uh, all of these people that we had been meeting throughout the week, they all came to the service and we, it was just an incredible moment of solidarity and togetherness. And and it's and it's not and it wasn't lost on us that it was at a historic black church in Washington D.C. Calvary Baptist and uh, uh, we appreciated your leadership in preparing that worship service for us that prayer service, Sarah. I want to we're going to be wrapping things up here, but I I wanted to have, uh, give each one of you an opportunity to share uh, experiences uh, um, of your meetings with congressional people in Washington, DC. If you could do that briefly, I'd appreciate it. And what your asks were. And so uh, Sarah Kay, you wanna start for us? Sure, so I, I am from Massachusetts and I met with uh, staffers for Senator Warren and a staffer for um, Representative Lori Trahan. And um, I, <sighs> <laughs> I, I think most people would say, yeah. would say the yeah. same thing. Exactly. That's 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 what I got to say. Um, no, it was my first. I, I've done the phone calls and I've done the emails. This is my first time going into uh, a meeting and having that that experience of doing direct advocacy work in in a meeting setting. And um, I was very glad to have done it. My sense from the uh, staffers was that they know. Um, and uh, everything that we had to say was not not surprising uh, to the folks that we met with. Um, and I also got the sense that from the staffers that there was a desire to kind of agree or affirm um, whether or not that will translate into any sort of shift or change for the politicians themselves. I, I don't know. I I wish that I were more hopeful uh, about that, to be honest, but my, my, I went away from it with a sense of, this is what I just, we have to keep doing this. We have to keep on going and keep on, keep on being that uh, persistent widow. Um, and uh, regardless of whether or not the, the judge is just or not, and I believe that the uh, politicians that we've got right now are, are, are the unjust judge, but um, we have to keep on being persistent and keep on going and telling the story. Um, Thank you. A faithful witness. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, uh, well, I met with eight congressional representatives, uh, two of whom were from Washington state, Maria Cantwell and Senator Murray. And we met, I wish we had been able to meet with the, uh, Congress people themselves instead of just staffers and interns. But I feel like uh, we, we we were like, um, I feel like a, a voice crying in the wilderness, you know, but but I, I appreciated the opportunity to be there and tell our story. And before the last thing I want to say is that there is a documentary that you can see on YouTube. And it's uh, it was produced and directed by one of the um, people on our delegation named Joshua Vice. that's V-I-S. And it's two hours long, you can see it on YouTube and it defines precisely and exactly what we saw when we were on our trip uh, th two weeks ago because he in introduces most of the people that talk to our delegation. So, I mean, that is worth every single minute if you wanna know what's going on on the ground in Palestine, thank you. Yeah, we uh, we interviewed Josh when the film first came out, The Law and the Prophets, and I think Sarah Offner-Seals just put it in the chat. Uh, Sarah, 
Ofner Seals, you want to uh, tell us about your uh, dele uh, your uh, congressional visit or visits? Sure. I so I'm one of the few folks uh, I think who met with a Republican uh, senator. I met with a, not with the senator himself, but with the staff a staff member for Senator Todd Young of Indiana, and um, and so I went in with. Uh, not a lot of expectations, not sure quite what to expect, but we were listened to and we met with the staffer for about an hour and he was very engaged with us. He didn't always agree with us, but I think he was most moved. Uh, I, I'm, I was there as one of his constituents, but I also had two members of the delegation with me uh, who had been in the West Bank and they told the story of Daoud at Tent of Nations uh, and the settlers who were intimidating them with their automatic weapons and saying, this is our land. And um, and he seemed very interested. He took a lot of notes as we talked about uh, those firsthand experiences. And so uh, when we weren't talking about policy, when we were just talking about this is what's happening, this is these are the stories of the people who live there, that's when he seemed most engaged, most interested um, and willing to really really hear what we had to say. I've been trying to follow up with uh, with that a staffer. Um, as I'm on my hunger strike this week, I've been contacting him every day. I have not heard back from him yet. But I did just get a note from Beth Moore of the Friends of Tent of Nations North America that they are hoping to reach out to this same staffer um, to um, to kind of push him a little harder. So I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be able to to get that message across. And Sarah Beth, I think, is on this Zoom webinar right now. And she wrote me yesterday and I gave her your name to reach out to Todd Young. So uh, please answer, Beth, because I told her you would. Uh, cool. <laughs> Diane, uh, your visit. Well, I was the only delegate from Wisconsin. So I, I went to visit one of our senators, Tammy Baldwin, and my congressman, Mark Pocan, joined by other parts of our delegation. And um, I, I just think it's a matter of, it's kind of like eating your vegetables. We have to show up. We have to be counted. And I don't think any of us would say this was the inspiring part of our trip. But it was essential, and it meant so much to the people that we met in Palestine to know we would be going directly to Washington, D.C. And it meant something to the people in Washington, D.C., in terms of our credibility, to be able to say, we've just returned, and we've just heard these people. So it was well worth doing. I'm not sure that, speaking for myself, that the interviews I was part of will change things very much, but I do know that that we are counted and noted and every visit, every call, every letter gets gets um, put into the totals and that I've got minimal confidence in what people, what politicians say to me, but these kind of visits might be part of what moves Charles Schumer does somehow come out of his shell and say things that he never would have dreamed of saying. It moves the president to understand the peril he's in. It moves people to understand if they care about Palestine, they are not alone. And we mm -hmm. keep discovering allies that we didn't know were there. So I think our going was an essential part of the plan for this delegation. And I understand and really honor it. And I'm glad we did it. And I think it deserves to be duplicated. So closing thoughts, Stephanie, you first. Two things I learned is the uh, systemic discrimination, oppression, and the crime of apartheid by the Israelis to the Palestinians has to end. And peace and security for the Israelis depends upon the peace and, and security of the Palestinians. And that's essentially the whole story. Uh, it's much more complex, I know, but those are, are the most important things, I think. And secondly, I want to thank you, Michael, with all my heart for providing this opportunity for me to go to Palestine. And uh, 
it was very difficult, but to me, it was one of the most important trips of my entire lifetime. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Sarah Offner Seals, please. So I think what is really on my mind and heart as we end this um, webinar is the fact that in just a few days, we will celebrate Palm Sunday. We will observe Palm Sunday, and then we will go into Holy Week, and we will observe Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday story is where we find those words that if I were to be silent, even the stones would cry out. And that is so convicting to me in this moment right now to think about the fact that we are being called to speak, to stand up for the truth, no matter what the cost. For Jesus, we know what the cost was. He is calling us to walk with him towards the cross. And if we stay silent, even the stones will cry out. So for me, that's what I leave this with. That's how I will go into Holy Week this year. Sarah Kay, any closing thoughts um, for you? Thank you. Yes, um, some things that I will stay with me. Um, the experience of picking up a tear gas canister in Ida refugee camp, which there's a sign as you enter that says, "The most tear gas, welcome to the most tear gas place in the world. Um, picking up that tear gas canister and seeing made in the USA on it and um, walking the wall surrounding Bethlehem and recognizing that I've also walked another wall at uh, the southern border of the United States, just recognizing the fact that this oppression, this um, this the system of empire that is being out outsourced around the world is coming coming from my home, from my people and recognizing that I am responsible and I am accountable for that uh, knowledge now that I have it and now that I've borne witness to it. Um, one of the many beautiful pieces of resistance uh, drawn on the, the wall. Um, there's a note that says, I am not free until you are. And that that is what is going to stay with me, um, that I am not free until Palestine is free. Thank you, Sarah. Diane? The uh, documentary that's been referred to, The Law and the Prophets, is profound. And it closes with Joshua Viss talking about the role of the prophet. And he said something I haven't heard said in quite the same clear, simple way. When he talked about a prophet's life is shaped by failure because the prophet is calling toward a reality which is so far from present that that the living inside the failure in order to shape and build and call for that which we're building is a very demanding role to play. And I feel that the people that I met in Palestine, people that I meet here in the United States who are devoted to this work are prophetic in their efforts. And sometimes we forget how prophetic we are actually being because we are so aware of our failure that we get up every day and the injustice is still there. And yet what the Palestinians show us is a kind of steadfastness, which is contagious and which I think places us in the shoes of the prophet however badly we think those shoes might fit us in our context and our skills and abilities and talents. I think that's who we're called to be. Thanks very much, Michael. Diane, thank you. I wanna say uh, uh, thanks to uh, Sarah and Sarah and Diane and Stephanie. So thanks to all of you. Blessed Palm Sunday, blessed Holy Week, blessed Easter, all of you, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>